Good evening and welcome to our special broadcast of Africa News Network ANN7 Prime with me, Cindy Mabi. Always wonderful having you. And of course, I'm not alone. I'm here with my esteemed uh, guest and also colleague, Edwin Haswe. Good evening to you. Good evening, Cindy. Mm. So, of course, uh, the nation awaits uh, the big expose that we've been promoting and essentially trying to get to the bottom of what is going on at Treasury, who all are involved, uh, and uh, if any action have been taken at all. Well, today, ANN7 brings you a sensational expose that will shake the very foundation of the nation's view of Treasury. ANN7 has accessed an internal Treasury audit report that shows how millions in taxpayers' money went down the drain on the National Treasury's watch between April 2014 and August 2015. Now, an internal Treasury audit into government's integrated financial management system reveals how Treasury committed 54 financial misconducts in just 17 months. And what we have been told is that no one has been held accountable yet for these transgressions. And this tale of mismanagement, millions of taxpayers' money were lost due to financial irregularities, including wasteful expenditure and duplicate payments. And clearly, the organization that should safeguard the financial interests of the nation was caught napping on the job. Question is whether after the damning re revelations today, will the opposition and NGOs who are quick to run to the courts uh, will take the National Treasury to court? Well, to break it down to our viewers, let's go across to my colleague Abigail Fisahi to take us through what the integrated financial management system is, who all were involved in it, and when and how these financial misconducts were exposed for the first time. Abigail? Well, thank you very much, uh, Edwin, and good evening to all of our viewers. Let's take a closer look at this project and unpack what it actually is. Taking a look at Treasury's IFMS project, the project was cleared in 2005 for supply chain, human resource, financial, payroll, and business intelligent management. Taking a further look at what else this uh, project entailed, the project was meant to integrate all central and provincial governments, departments, financial management processes as well. Taking a look, three different departments, Treasury, CETA, and Department of Public Services and Administration were all involved. Taking a further look, seven years later, review found the IFMS system to be inadequate and a revised plan was accepted by Cabinet. That took place in 2013. An internal review ordered in 2015 to measure the efficiency of the IFMS payments as well. And taking a further look, the review report was filed with the DG, Minister and Deputy Minister. That was on the 11th of September 2015. But moving along, let's take a look at Treasury's financial misconduct exposed. Uh, internal Treasury audit exposes the gross financial mismanagement in Treasury's IFMS project. Taking a further look, internal audit reviews all IFMS payment processes that from the 1st of April 2014 to the 31st of August in 2015. A further look now, 49 of the total 54 findings of the audit in the IFMS project were identified as catastrophic uh, in that uh, program. And also findings include inadequate payment procedures, lack of project costs monitoring, excessive expenditure in, uh, in ineffective resource management, amongst uh, other things as well. But we are going to keep you up to date. Findings expose Treasury's non-existent financial and operating controls and non-compliance with laws and regulations regulations as well. It's back to the main studio for now. We're back to you, Cindy and Edwin. Thanks so much, uh, Abby. And of course, we have our esteemed uh, panelists. Fiso Matlango is an NN7 resident uh, political analyst. Cecilia Russell, NN7 editor for special projects. Tsepo Khadima is a political analyst. Uh, Professor Andre Thomas-Hausen is a constitutional law expert. Masiri Tsiane is with the South African Liberty Foundation as their chairperson. And Zanele Mloana, deputy national convener of Black First and Land First, will uh, join us on the phone line. Good evening, good evening, and thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I think what, what we heard from Abby essentially was the objectives, the rationale of setting up this uh, integrated financial management system project, if you will. Tsepo, being intimately involved uh, or, or, or having intimate information around it, just give us a sense, an executive summary of the effectiveness of this particular project. Yeah, I think essentially what we saw is that there's 10 years that lapsed from the time that cabinet took a decision to really integrate, that is to ensure that sitting from National Treasury, you could have a see-through 
right across the government spectrum, be it at national as well as uh, provincial, even at local government level, in terms of uh, spending, the efficacy of uh, those uh, spending patterns, and uh, a whole host number of things. So the rationale itself, most certainly, I think uh, one cannot question it, except uh, to lament the fact that it took 10 years. But now what is more, I think, uh, egregious as far as this situation is concerned is that we see now that come 2014, when now a decision is taken to establish a project management office now to ensure that this very important uh, you know, enterprise resource planning system is implemented, then we, of course, uh, now got to know that uh, processes were not followed. There was no vetting of, uh, in terms of their skill and even in terms of uh, uh, security levels of the various subcontractors that worked on it. But what is even worse is then to find that the level of um, uh, cost overruns and where procedures were not followed. Now that, of course, has to concern us. Has to concern us because we are dealing here with a department who the protest at all material times has been that it is a a department and a ministry that is a model of good governance, that after all is a center of excellence. And uh, this is not the only one. We saw that, by the way, the principals that are involved here, we saw what they did with uh, South African Revenue Service, where again, an IT tender which was 100 million rand, it ended up uh, with a cost overrun to 1.4 billion rand. In this case, a budget for five years was spent in 17 <coughs> months. Those are the things that are very important, I think, for the nation now to be asking questions, but also to hold those that are responsible accountable, and I hold them accountable in the relevant areas. But more importantly, I think the, the case is made. Will all the civil society as well as the opposition political parties that have been the loudest and that have been the ardent supporters of the erstwhile finance minister, will they now come out? after this expose and really make sure that they are on the right side of history. Yeah, and, and we need to mention also that the former Director General in Treasury, Lungi Safuzile, uh, we had sent questions to Treasury as well. They haven't responded just uh, as yet. And we go now to Mtun Zimbata. He is our output producer who's gone through this entire 77-page internal report or audit report. It's over to you, Mtun uh, good evening, Cindy, and all our viewers. Um, what transpired was uh, Treasury <coughs> and the Department of Public Service and Administration and the State uh, Information and Technology Agency ha had this project to put together which would streamline uh, government's uh, procurement and financial uh, uh, management systems. But uh, what happened was when um, the uh, through the cause of uh, setting up this project, it was realized that um, not everything was on cause. And then uh, they were tasked with uh, correcting this. And that is when these transgressions happened. And in a space of 17 months, you find that um, 54 uh, financial transactions were flagged, and that's where it all went wrong. But these are not just regular uh, transactions. It's not just taking petty cash and not accounting for it. We're talking about billions that were spent and not accounted for. So in terms of the, the, the recommendations uh, in the report, uh, some even calling it catastrophic, what, what are the implications for Treasury? Well, the implications are, are very huge because uh, we know that Treasury is supposed to be the custodian of the country's uh, financial security. So if these things are happening under Treasury's watch, it makes you wonder what would happen yeah. in other institutions. Is there any, any indication that the remedial action or recommendations have been uh, applied or that anything had been done since this report has come to surface? Well, to the best of our knowledge, no, no one has been held accountable and no action has been taken. All right, Mtunzi, let's uh, come back to our studio audience and we'll start with Cecilia uh, and just to unpack it again in terms of this uh, IFMS uh, project and where it's gone wrong. Okay, I think that the IMFS project was started with the best intentions. We have government, uh, government departments that can't talk to each other, that should talk to each other. 
Um, it would be easy um, to be able to assess what's happening in a province from a national level if you have systems that talk to each other. So I think that we should start with that. Then in 2005, um, when, they, when they started the project, I say with the best intentions. Seven years later, there were a whole lot of deliverables that hadn't you know, hadn't yet been delivered, even though lots of money had been spent, and so they reassessed it. This particular report takes us from 2013, when they decided to do the reassessment, for 17 months from then. In that space of, in that space of time, in a 4.3 billion rand project, they have found uh, numerous, um, numerous examples of, 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 mis, of, of mismanagement, of money that has been um, um, allocated to, 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 to companies, and then um, uh, there's been no financial accounting um, following them. There's been misaccounting as far as, for example, hours billed. Um, there's been uh, people, uh, one particular company, as we'll go through later, got a, um, a, a massive contract, gave the, com the government a quote for that contract. The quote was then spontaneously, and we can't work out why, inflated by at least uh, 10 million rand. And then um, when they tried to rectify it later, um, they found that in actual fact, it, you know, they, they, they hadn't taken into account that they had already paid this company 5 million rand. So somehow or another, in all of this accounting, there seem to be no processes, no logical um, accounting you know, uh, practices that were put into place to ensure that this kind of mismanagement of money was, 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 was caught and, and fixed at, at, this, at source. Mm. Sfiso Matlangu is with us as well. He also spent the entire afternoon pouring through the, uh, this report. Uh, where did it all go wrong, Sfiso? Because uh, we just need to chat it from when it started and uh, right up to uh, 2012. I think this, uh, this report is going to take us even more time to understand what happened at Treasury. I think the part we've come to understand is very shocking at the moment. Um, you remember, Edwin, that 54 findings uh, are, are cited and 49 are considered to be catastrophic. Now, let's remember that this is an internal audit. It's not even an external audit. Now, if so many findings are there um, in an internal audit, what happens if it's an external? Mr. Uh, Fuzile was there when these recommendations were made. This was looting, but he did not say anything. I think the question that we should put out there is, what did the minister say? Uh, what actions did uh, the minister do? And I think two things just bring to light when, when considering that uh, this looting uh, happened. Some people double billed, double billed the, the, the DG said nothing or it did not meet our attention. Uh, Minister Pravin Gordon came out of office and left Treasury. But uh, this report collected dust because it was not brought to light. Now, Treasury in this country is the institute that sort of acts as the big brother or the stop cop of uh, other agencies. You see Treasury come and speak of how other state entities or SOEs did wrong. Mr. Pravin Gordon in an ivory tower speaks uh, candidly about uh, how uh, other you know, organizations or other organs of state are corrupt. But why did this report gather dust under his watch? I think now he's out, but we have to ask the question, these recommendations, were they ever implemented? And why not? You know, uh, this is people's funds. These are South African taxpayers. And uh, nothing was done about it. I think from this day moving forward, South Africans must just be aware um, Treasury has lost, lost its gaze. Uh, Treasury has lost its uh, supermodel appeal in, in society. The, the, the intricacies of what internally happens in Treasury shock us. Uh, when we read this report. I, I hasten to say, if there's an external report, what more will be revealed in, in the South African Treasury? I think it's a shock to us. Mm. Uh, but just constitutionally, and, and, and I suppose with the government policies and the various acts that, that um, uh, govern how processes and, and system ought to work, uh, Professor Thomas Housen, this is not expected of Treasury, the, 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 you know, the custodians of taxpayers' monies. What ought they to have done? Because at, at the moment, we haven't heard any other response uh, to, of any action being taken. Well, I think on the, on the upside, this will teach us to, to um, 
deal with each other with a little bit more modesty. As, um, I, I, I'm your uh, co-opted uh, German South African. So in Germany we have a saying, if you're sitting in a glass house, don't throw with stones because they can come flying back to you. And, um, and it just shows that uh, uh, the, the same ineptitude, the same lack of skills, and the same poor management systems that we, that we find in many government departments will also exist in the Department of Finance. And that's logical. Why should the Department of Finance be so fantastic and excellent uh, when that is not the average performance in, in the country? The, the other issue, of course, is that of, of uh, uh, that we want to be a rule of law country. Things have to be lawful. People mustn't just decide by a whim but they must decide in, in accordance with their legal duties and, and their powers, and there has to be a good administrative oversight. In, in many modern countries, uh, we are moving to e-government, and, and we have uh, institutionalized performance assessment and institutionalized checks and controls whether things are being done lawfully. I, I am an assessor for, for performance management in, in the United Arab Emirates. I go there regularly on that job. Uh, this uh, attempt to bring in a new software, the IFMS, is, is a very positive initiative. But it got stuck. It got stuck in a lack of oversight and, um, and one could even say a shambolic way of, of running affairs. Prof, we'll come back to you. Uh, let's just go across again to our colleague uh, Abigail Fisahi once again to understand who were involved and who were in the know of this internal report and why no alleged action was taken. Give us the timeline again, uh, Abigail. We'll do, Edwin. Thank you very much. Uh, let's take a closer look now at who uh, is responsible and in what way they are responsible as well. The first person, Bunkisa Fuzile, former Treasury uh, DG, and he was responsible for overall oversight uh, in that regard. Taking another look, Jay Nair, acting AG Treasury, also uh, responsible for uh, oversight. Uh, the third person, uh, H. Bula, Chief Director of IFMS, responsible to secure action. Uh, in that regard. Another person, Lindy Budewick, Chief Director, Technical Support Services for Treasury, uh, responsible to secure action as well. And the last person, M. Cluey, Director, Integrated Financial Management System, uh, responsible to act uh, in this regard. Edwin and Cindy, that's it for now. What's back to you? Thanks so much, Abby. And of course, Musiri Tiane with the South African Liberty Foundation uh, joins us as well. Just what your observations are in light of uh, this information regarding irregularities, no less of 54 processes that have been flagged in this report. Catastrophic. Um, that's the word you can describe. Uh, the, there are no missing dots to fill. The dots are filled. At that time and period, who was in charge? Who was the political head of that institution? The political head of that institution at that time was an obvious minister who was perceived to be the guardian angel of all rights within South Africa, particularly when it comes to uh, proper finance management. He has failed us. That's, there is no question about it. He's failed South Africans in, 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 in a catastrophic way. The man in, in whom others have seen or perceived to be a hero has now turned into a villain. It, it, it's, it's clear now. There's no question about it. And, and I would agree uh, with Professor and say in Germany, if you are living in a, in a glass house, they're not throw stones. But in these instances, uh, we see that the man has been throwing stones, making allegations to others without evidence. Here, we've got evidence. There is an internal audit which is undisputed. There's no question about it. You can't make double payments, and therefore, and this particularly is a report which is hidden. You keep it underneath, you, you take it from the desk, put it somewhere else, let it be filled with dust, and you come and want to then for come in South Africa and say, look at those ones, they're the ones who are corrupt. Look at those ones, they're the ones who are mismanaging South Africa. Thank God he was removed. Mm. Yeah, and, and, and also under Ntantanene, maybe, you know, this gives, gives credence to why uh, he was removed in the first place as a finance minister. But we'll give you more details regarding the companies who had benefited from the irregular uh, processes in terms of not bidding, closed tenders, etc. during this time period. We go back uh, to my colleague Mtunzi Mbata. Mtunzi, furthermore, in terms of the, you know, uh, uh, Director General having access to, to uh, the uh, document, the internal report, 
We know that the minister, deputy minister, and all the other mentioned uh, employees at Treasury who had access to it, still no action has been taken. Well, it's very concerning that the <clears throat> There has been this veil of secrecy around this document. It's been around uh, for years, but uh, no action has been taken. So it makes you wonder what uh, the reasons could be for, for not anyone taking action on this. Ella Luana, she is the deputy convener for a Land First Black, Black First Land First. Anella, good to have you. Good evening to you. What do you make of this expose? Hi, Zanele. All right, we'll try and get back uh, to Zanele. Tepo, I mean, you, you also laid a complaint, uh, was it last year, regarding the same matter of irregularity within Treasury and who benefits from major lucrative government contracts. What, what was the, the um, context of, or content of your complaint? And it, it largely really rested on that the full financial implications of the integrated financial management system as was to be implemented and the contract that was to be irregularly uh, awarded, those full financial implications were not fully disclosed to the South African public. And it may be, it, this is opportune now with the new minister who's got a, a new acting uh, DG to really come clean and disclose to the South African public and the citizens as to the full financial implications. The number that uh, has been uh, bandied about, based on those that are really uh, subject matter experts on the contract, is 100 billion rand. That in terms of the full tenure of the integrated financial management system, which has been awarded to a US IT giant, that's really the full, uh, the, the implication. Now, are South Africans aware that that process of trying to have efficient governance and efficient reporting and the ability to see if we, there is appropriateness in the spending of our budget, are they aware that uh, the price take is 100 billion rand? And if it is not 100 billion rand, well, what is it exactly taking into account the number of licenses that have to, uh, the various uh, government departments and ministries will have to be reporting on? So that's really the, ba the background upon which uh, and one was raising that, to say, unless you factor that, that full cost implication mm. into, into our budget going forward, it is not possible. Now, we sit here, we are seeing in terms of administrative failings of uh, the ministry and the department that for a long time we were told that it is the best that has ever been. But over and above that is not only in terms of administrative decisions, but also at policy decisions level as well. In terms of macroeconomic policy, the management thereof has been appalling. So if anything, I think, I mean, we, we are shocked here. But tonight, I think South Africans will start to see that uh, when the curtain got lifted, the emperor was found to be without clothes. Okay, on that note, uh, very graphic. Uh, Zanele Luana is the deputy convener of Black First Land First. Good evening to you and thanks for joining us. I mean, as a BLF, your concerns around what seems to be a very shoddy job in terms of running processes and systems in Treasury and the fact that only few companies uh, who, who themselves were appointed illegitimately or illegally for that matter have, uh, have been fleecing South Africa of so, of so many millions. What is your reaction? Yeah, we have always said as the Black First Land First movement that the Treasury is an entity that shows corruption in this country. So therefore, as the BLF, we are not surprised that the Treasury is directly implicated on these corrupt activities in this country. And to also show also the biasness of white media in this country and the biasness of the so-called anti-corruption civil society in this country, it's only, for example, the African News Network that has took up this story, that has invested time to, to, to dig into the issue, to try and, 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 and uncover it on, on what does this mean and what does this, how does this implicate the Treasury and the, the, the country as a whole. If this was another, for example, state-owned um, entity that was implicated, for example, in such corruption, for example, ESCOM, we would have seen how Amapungane, for example, would have come out guns blazing, um, de um, demoralizing, 
whatever is implicated in this, it shows how Treasury also does not have at heart a clear program to radically change the outlook of this country and to create opportunities where the, the economy of this country is open up and not only uh, monopolized within one, dra- one race, which is white in this country. Um, we are not shocked at all. We do hope that the civil society, which has been quite vocal, particularly to people like the president of the country, that he is corrupt, opposition parties who have been quite vocal, for example, on, in demoralizing state-owned institutions such as the SABC, for example, such as the South African Airways, such as the ESCOM. What are they going to do now that evidence has been put forward that there's been a mismanagement of funds in this country, in, 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 in Treasury, Treasury, which is a very important arm within the finance ministry. We are not surprised, though, because this corruption happens under the nose of the ex-finance minister, such as Pavin Godan, happens under the nose of the DG or Mr. Lungisa, people that have, built, that have built a legacy of protecting white interests in this country. Zanel, probably Zanel, let, going me, to get away. let me just interrupt you there because uh, we're going to now get into details of what has happened at Treasury. Now for the big revelation here on ANN7, we're going to go to uh, Abigail Fisahi. She'll bring us uh, details on the Deming internal audit report. Over to you, Abigail, to take us through the key points. Right, Edwin, let's get to the crux of the story, and that's uh, the findings, the basic findings here. Uh, let's take a look now uh, at uh, those findings. There they are. Treasury's catastrophic report card. A total of 54 IFMS financial processes were flagged in this internal audit. Taking a look at another finding, 49 of those processes were found to be catastrophic. A further look here, uh, five other financial processes were assessed as a high risk uh, in that regard and the audit found no business case for formulating of IFMS project management office. Going further in detail, no budget information and no budget breakdown per financial year either and project costs monitoring was lacking as well. Taking a further look at the basic findings, the formal independent quality assurance function was also missing and uh, incomplete payment register uh, as well. Further findings, excessive project management office expenditure and taking a further look, ineffective resource management was found in that regard as well. More findings, undefined uh, purpose, scope and objectives of the payment procedure and uh, taking a further look, inadequate delegation of authority for payment procedure as well. Edwin and Cindy, that's a look at some of the basic findings uh, in that report. It's back to you for now. Well, it's a damning report. Let's get into it. Let's get into it with more detail. I mean, this is not just a mere blip uh, into how Treasury functions. It's, it's, it's more than um, it's, it's as serious as, as it looks. Look, we were dismayed with the cost overruns on Nkandla. If anything, tonight we should be horrified because now we are talking about billions and billions of rents. It's no longer just a few hundreds of millions of there. And the question that must be asked is that after tonight's expose, will the portfolio committee and SCOPA particularly summon National Treasury to come and uh, address the nation as early as next week, in the new week, to come really and uh, come clean and tell the nation what is happening. But if anything, as we say, it's systematic uh, in, in terms of uh, really what Treasury has been, and particularly all the organs that are reporting to Treasury. We've seen also with the Financial Intelligence Center, for example, where Marie Mitchell, who, by the way, I hasten to add that, has been irregularly appointed into that position. And I don't know why Parliament has still not done anything or asked anything. In fact, they were very happy to receive him, where he casually, <coughs> in a sanguine way, say, well, 60 billion rand last week was last year was illicitly moved out of the country and maybe we could be doing something else and nobody was horrified that 60 billion rand was out of the country now we know here 4 billion rand was spent within 17 months and in fact the uh, outcome of that 4 billion rand expenditure is in doubt in terms of uh, its appropriateness 
and in terms of whether the objective has been met. So what are we to do with a situation like this? If anything, urgent uh, action has to be taken. The President of the Republic, uh, after all, he has to pay particular attention and take urgent action on this to stop this rot. For if we do not stop this rot, it's only a matter of time, we will have no country. And also to ensure that the new minister can ensure that the people that they are putting into these key positions most importantly have been vetted. They've got many people there, as I say, from director, chief director, deputy director general, who have not been vetted howsoever, and yet they're dealing with absolutely sensitive state things. And at the end of the day, are we getting fair value for the 1.1 trillion rand that we spent, that is our budget, and the answer is a categoric no. Cecilia, same question to you because uh, you've read the report. Yes. Um, we poured over it uh, throughout this afternoon. Yeah. It's, not, it's not just the small thing that has happened. And, and some of the basic uh, checks and balances in, in the Treasury systems uh, were, were quite shocking. Well, I just think that their definition of what catastrophic is is, is, is in itself um, an indictment of, of what was going on in that department. Inadequate financial management processes, so there was no finance managers. The actions could bring the national and treasury brand reputation into, into, into disrepute. Non-existent financial and operating control. Not that it existed in any form, non-existent. Non-compliance to laws and regulations, which means that there was actually no control over any of the spending that, you know, um, of, uh, uh, in these 54 um, um, transactions that were flagged or, or issues that were flagged. It seems to me that you know, uh, if people really do need to account. This is not just you know, a little bit of irregular expenditure. When you say there's non-compliance to laws and regulations and non-existent financial and operating control, and this is, this is, the, this is, the, this is the tag that 49, I think, 49 or 47 of them received, um, it, it, it seems like um, for, 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 for Treasury, it seems like it was you know, doing its own thing without any without anybody um, looking at, over its shoulder at all. Yeah, I, I mean, what's the rationale of setting up an integrated <coughs> financial management system project that doesn't really have objectives or SOPs or particular outcomes, and it spends all of this money that is benefiting a handful of, of contractors? Well, that's the whole idea, so that it can benefit a handful of people. That is the nature of the South African economy to benefit a handful of people. That is the, the, the mark and the build-up. It is the financial makeup of this country. It is the, the financial infrastructure of South Africa to benefit a few and not the masses. Uh, Oxfam did a study where the, you know, the wealth of only three people in this country are the millions that are in poverty in this country equal to. So it's, uh, it's not amazing that it was set up to, to benefit only a few. I think that was the intention. But on contracts, and it, let me just point out, um, uh, the, the, the fruitful and wasteful expenditure that the, the report highlights, uh, an authorized expenditure, um, ineffective project management, overspending on projects. If a project would cost one million, uh, it costs over 12 million. Uh, overpayment on, on clientele. Uh, if one you know, does work, they are overpaid. No bidding, no bidding process whatsoever. Uh, just one person, one company, uh, who, which has not been vexed, just gets a certain contract, and that company doesn't even invoice. You, you yeah, know, we'll, this report has found that the, invo so we'll, the invoices are we'll, not there. We'll, so. we'll come to that in, in more detail. Let me bring Musiri in because this project uh, at Treasury uh, overlaps with, uh, with the ministers that were in, in, in place. Um, how do we apportion blame in that case, uh, including the DGs and the DDGs and those below? We don't have to look any further. The, the blame is on the, the minister in charge. We don't even have to go look. There was a minister in charge. You know, when you look at this report and you get all the report, there is a, a strong word commonly used by one man say, people do as they please in that department. This report says that there was absolute disregard for all rules and regulations. People were doing as they like. And worst part of it is that this report was hidden. 
that makes matters even worse. And, 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 and the political head knew about it. We can't, there's no way in which he didn't know about it. This report was given to him. He ought to, you know, when, when you balance the, 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 the officers in charge, the persons that ought to be looking at the wrongs that any other department has to be doing, say, this is how you do it right. Your office should be an extremely clean office. It should be an exemplar of what should have happened, what ought to be do. This is what it resembles. This is how good administration should look like. Now, when it's like this, when it's do as you please, pay as much as you like, and actually flaunt the regulations that are there in the rules, it, it is, it's an absurd. It's a catastrophic. It's worse than anywhere else. Prof, do the rules, the legislation governing Treasury in this case uh, need to be overhauled? I don't think the problem is with the rules and, and uh, the regulations. The problem is maybe with the weakness of the institutions. I, I have on other occasions alerted that our parliament is weak. Uh, we can see on the internet that in 2015 this matter was before the portfolio committee in parliament. And the then responsible person from the state IT agency, CETA, Mr. Numvalo, admitted that he had spent 1.3 billion rand fruitlessly. He said, uh, it is a failure. We have got nothing for the 1.3 billion rand, but we will learn from our mistakes. Now, that was in March 2015. That is over two years ago. And, and Parliament did not act. Parliament did not hold the minister accountable. So we, we, we are dealing with a weakness of, of that main institution that should be the real guardian of our democracy. Instead, we keep running to the courts. Um, they cannot replace the function of Parliament. Mm. Because it, it seems to me that, you know, the Treasury as the financial police are not themselves policed. The duty would be on the portfolio committee and on Parliament and to forget party allegiances and to forget uh, sympathies, uh, but to, um, to become more self-confident in, in, in doing their part to contribute uh, to better outcomes. It, it is... Uh, <coughs> A matter that will happen in any country that things go wrong. Mm. We don't have experience with IT because during the apartheid years, South Africa was basically cut off from IT developments and, and many programs had to be locally written and, and we didn't accompany the world's developments in this, in this case. It, it is curious that the company that won this tender is, is the one big IT company that remained faithful to South Africa during the apartheid years. Maybe this is why they won the tender. Um, but their main competitor, uh, who actually happens to be a German company, today processes, in terms of IT, processes 80% of the world's GDP. It runs most government management systems in the world. Why were they excluded? Uh, where's the transparency? Why did Parliament never intervene? So these are things that I think we, that these are the bigger lessons we can learn from this case. And otherwise, it is good that we're debating it. It means our democracy is alive. Mm -hmm. Citizens are taking responsibility and are reflecting. And, and uh, I suppose the expose also is an indication that not all things can be hidden, especially in this technology mm -hmm. era, but it also makes us now question where the money goes. And I think as taxpaying citizens, we ought to know the paper trail and, and in how contracts have been uh, awarded over so many years and favoring a certain particular group of companies. Tempo. So uh, for, for Treasury, if it indeed uh, before the Portfolio Committee, there was an opportunity to question what's going on and, and try and recover the money, and nothing has been done. Has that just been a culture of impunity to say, oh, well, you know, we overspent here and there, let's move right <coughs> along? Well, over the years we have seen that, uh, I think, uh, in Treasury, you know, I've said this, success is an exceedingly lousy teacher because it always seduces smart people into thinking they can't lose. And what we saw certainly was that uh, when there was a lot of uh, edification given to National Treasury in the early days of our democracy, that uh, edification and praise that they were receiving seduced them into thinking that uh, they can defy gravity and that, uh, you know, we are now horrified to find that in fact they do have feet of clay, but more so to the detriment of, uh, of our economy. So. These are things that now we need to be asking ourselves. Is Parliament, for example, are they, uh, have got the, the uh, qualified people that can ask the right questions? 
cabinet itself, for as long as you've got cabinet that works in silos, where each ministry, they do their own thing and no other ministry, they cannot uh, overcheck and, 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 and counteract each other. That is a problem that we are having. And these are the things that for, they have to be brought to an immediate end because if we do not do so, for example, let me give, this year alone, we're gonna raise 160 billion rand borrow, 160 billion rand in the bond market. None of that money is gonna come into the country, it's gonna go towards servicing the debt that we have. However, key thing is that, there are few banks that for the last 20 years have been earning fees in hundreds of millions of rands for writing those government bonds without any tender, without any accountability, without transformation, and parliament has never once asked about their fees that go to them. We'll, we'll come back to that. Let's uh, go back to Abigail. She's going to give us a more breakdown on uh, this expose and uh, tell us more about uh, this internal report that has found that Treasury has flouted a lot of its own regulations. Yes, indeed, Edwin. Let's take another look at some of those uh, further findings, those uh, catastrophic findings. Uh, Treasury never stated a business case for creation of IFMS project management office with a 145 million rand budget. Taking a look at further catastrophic findings, contracts awarded without addressing key aspects of a PMO function like quality, risk and cost management. Uh, in just 17 months, 139 million rand of the approved budget of 145 million was already spent and uh, only 6 million rand was left for the remaining 43 months. Taking a further look now and taking a look at uh, the impact and recommendations in this regard, potential fruitless and wasteful expenditure. The main recommendation there, current panel to be scrapped and a new panel to be installed via a competitive bidding process. A further look at uh, impacts and recommendations, uh, potential overspending on approved IFMS PMO budget. The main recommendation, a business case to be developed for formulation of the outstanding PMO, uh, those services in accordance with the approved budget. Another look at impact and main recommendation, inadequate contract management. The main recommendation in that regard, 10 processes outlined for effective and efficient financial management of the PMO. And taking a look at the final there, impact, inadequate and ineffective PMO function. The main recommendation there, 10 processes outlined for effective and efficient financial management of the PMO. Edwin and Cindy, it's back to you for now. Thanks so much, Abby. And let's just go back to our special projects editor, Cecilia Russell, to give us a breakdown of what these uh, remedial recommendations were in the audit report regarding the processes that needed to be implemented in yes, Treasury. Yes, there were many, obviously. Um, you know, they said that, for example, um, where, the, where, you know, where, the, where, where, the, where the contracts were irregular, they should be scrapped and you should go back to a competitive bidding process. Competitive bidding process is something that you hear very often from Treasury, but it seemed as though in this report, as far as we can see, that particular process you know, uh, uh, didn't that sort of that process didn't come into in, in, into in, into the into the awarding of these of these um, of these co of, of these contracts? I can't even say they were tenders because we're unclear whether there was any tender process. It's not clear from the, from, from the report. So, but I think that there was a failure both within the organisation and externally, um, as uh, you know, uh, you know, Parliament holding holding them to account. There were no, there was no, nothing internally. I mean. Government procurement of services is very carefully. Um, it should. I mean, there are rules and regulations that are that are, that are there for everybody to see. It would seem as though those were flouted, and then beyond those being flouted, when these companies, you know, started working, there was no checks and balances. You know, um, there were hours that are, you know, that 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 are not uh, double accounted for. All of these things, you know, if I, if, if we just run a petty cash in a normal organization, you know immediately money going out and money going in. There seem to have been carte blanche in, 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 in case of, 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 these, of, these, of these particular um, um, cases. Let, let's just discuss the, you know, the IFMF, uh, IFMS. <laughs> um, and, you know, there was no reason to, uh, there was no business reason to establish the PMO. Yes. Uh, just, just talk to us about that because uh, once it was established, it, it had these gaps, and, yes. and, and yes. that showed how catastrophic yes. this uh, whole yes. process. Yes. 
Um, before you start a department, you need to have a rationale for starting the department. You need to know what it's going to do. You need to, I'm just doing it in, in layman's language, it was very kind of complex in that. You, you, you need to put in place your budget. You need to put in place your personnel that are going to manage it. You need to make sure that you've got your aims and objectives, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In this particular case, they did not seem to, they did not seem to have put in place any of those things. They just had a, you know, a, a budget, and then they started an office, and then they invited, or, or they identified eight uh, uh, service providers. There didn't seem to be any, you know, a proper, a proper checks and balances around that. And then uh, the, what the service providers were doing, there didn't seem to be a rationale. They didn't seem to be moving in a particular direction. And so within the report, it's, it's very critical about this particular, this particular department within, with, with, within, this, within this project. Because without any of these systems in place and aims and objectives and what have you, all the money, uh, it seems to have been kind of been spent and not sure where it's going and w what the deliverables were, et cetera, et cetera. All of that seems, all of that base work seems to be missing from, yeah. from, what we, from the reports or what the reports I says. mean, Mr. Khadima here was referring to how much more this could cost uh, the taxpayer, including the fact that, or notwithstanding the fact that, you know, it's money that could be used for service delivery, et cetera. But if you look at this, uh, uh, the PMO, or rather the uh, uh, project management office that was set up contract signed, the, the necessary team assembled to do a particular function and even paid for that matter, and yet they have nothing to show for it. For a department that is supposed to be pristine, that has to be immaculate and, 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 and follow the money as it were. Why, why do we see that? Um, well, it's, it's very good to set up structures in policy. And I think that's the political debate of the difference between policy and polity. Uh, it's very easy to draw very good policies on paper and to set up structures and even create budget. And I mean, treasury funding, treasury in this case should be easier than the Department of All Small Business Development asking for more money from treasury. You remember Ms. Uh, Lindu Izulu, who's the Minister of Small Business Development, crying to say, uh, Mr. Pravin Gordon has not increased our budget and radical economic transformation cannot work here. But treasury funding, treasury is not an issue. So of course in paper and on policy it would look good, but when, when you have to talk about deliverables, you find that it's people's money, taxpayers' money that is uh, accumulating in wealth over treasury, not used, or it's people's money that uh, is just misused and uh, goes into things that accumulate to corruption. Because I think we should not avoid the word that this is looting at its highest and uh, this is corruption. I think South Africans moving on from this expose, we should not be quiet. Uh, you know, the Democratic Alliance, I aim to hear what they will say, freedom under law, Save South Africa, the Helen Sussman Foundation, uh, Scopa. I think no one should be quiet after this to say this is people's money, particularly now because the church has become so vocal you know, in the political periphery, particularly now when, when uh, even parliamentarians have a voice even outside of the party. Let people speak against Treasury because this is all our money collectively. It's something that collectively, I think, as South Africans, we must not stop with this expose. People must be jailed or people must account or the campaign must lead to say, pay back the money. Yeah, coming up uh, on the show, of course, we'll come with more details of uh, which companies are uh, involved. And over the next few days, we'll, of course, bring you more details. It's an extensive uh, internal report uh, that we've been uh, looking at. Uh, this is just the beginning of uh, all the details that we will bring you here on ANN7 over the next few days. And of course, we've invited Treasury and sent uh, the required questions as to what transpired uh, during the tenure of uh, the various ministers and what, uh, or whether this money can even be recovered. So we're still awaiting response from Treasury on that part. Masiri, um, do you think that maybe in terms of our focus in where people uh, galvanize and, and they're, they're, they're very overzealous in terms of you know political space as opposed to the critical aspect of the economy, where the money goes, are we, are we vigilant enough in, 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 in holding uh, public bearers accountable for where the money goes? No, it is. <clears throat> no, we don't. 
I think we only look at whose name is it attached to a corrupt activity. If it is one or two individuals, we'll make a hell lot of noise. But when it comes to other people, we will be quiet. In actual fact, you'll hear the absolute silence within South Africans. They'll never, the, 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 the agencies that he has made mention of will not even make a single noise. The oppositions, the parliamentarians themselves will not even make noise. They'll remain quiet. They've been quiet all along. This report has been there. A over expenditure or rather a misuse that is then the department of over a billion unaccounted for. No one makes noise about it, yet that report went to Parliament. But would it have been other individuals? Ooh, South Africa would have been on a quiet, absolute noise, everywhere else shouting, pay back the money, pay back the money. Pay back the money, we say to the minister. We want that money paid back. You, you were leading that department. But that noise will not be heard. So in instance, what you have is that you are wrong because of a political <coughs> instance that you stand for. When you talk radical economic transformation, when you are in, in making sure that people's lives are going to change, when you start making that noise, when you ruffle those that are in control of the economy, no, no, you are a wrong man. And you'll be painted black in every newspaper all over South Africa. Media will make sure that there is bad light given about you. But should you just, just preach and protect the white monopoly control, no, no, you're fine. No matter how many billions you might have wasted, no, no, it's, it, it, it will keep it under wraps. Mm. That is the South African reality we have today. Okay, I mean, the concern obviously is that there needs to be accountability. Somebody needs to uh, be, be wrapped uh, over this, be it to, to repay the money or to even be prosecuted, if you will. But are we likely to see that, Professor, or, or maybe even benchmark it against best practices around the world? Well, definitely, if, if money has been stolen, normally there's fraud involved. Somebody said, uh, I, can, I can design the system, but it's maybe a company that hasn't even learned how to use a laptop. So there's fraud, there's misrepresentation of, of capacities, and then payments are made, and there's collusion. So there should be some criminal investigations. The, the, the questions should be asked, who benefited? Where did this money go? And, um, and maybe some of it can be recovered. We, we must also not lose the focus of what's possible, what is positive in, in, in other countries. Uh, Prime Minister Modi in, in India only two years ago, in 2015, said, we will install 100 smart cities, 100 big cities with e-government, where it takes 20 minutes to get a license online, where it takes five minutes to make a payment, where things function better for the citizens at a much lower cost. Well, guess what? After two years, 80 of these systems are running in two years at a fraction of the cost of the money that we lost. It is possible to do this. India is a member with us in the BRICS. Why don't we turn to India? Most software today is actually developed and written in India anyway. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we, we can get people to help us, and, and, um, and it's very urgent that we catch up. We are falling behind. Brazil and India conduct all elections electronically, and they save hundreds of billions with this. We, we haven't even started to introduce, to consider an electronic voting system. Um, we, we, have to, uh, we have to work stronger with our BRICS partners when it comes to big IT development. All right, let's go to our colleague now. Uh, as we, we're chatting, we also try on a fact-finding fact uh, mission to try and make sense of this internal audit report from Treasury, which essentially says that many companies have benefited from financial irregularities at National Treasury. And one company in particular is Bits Technologies. Uh, they seem to have benefited a great deal from this financial mess at Treasury during uh, this period. Abigail Fasahi is standing by to give us the details. Uh, what more can you tell us about Bits Technologies? Yes, indeed, Cindy. Thank you very much. Let's take a closer look at the payments made to the named Bits Technologies. Uh, payment made to bits so without approval uh, of agreement in that regard also marked as catastrophic first uh, service legal agreement worth 39 million rand with bits technologies was cancelled that was cancelled on the 30th of september 2014 the second agreement was signed then on the 8th of december 2014 a revised value of 28 million rand in that regard 
Payment of 1.5 million rand made to bits for services rendered from October 2014 to the 7th of December 2014. And money paid for a period when no service level agreement existed between Treasury and bits technologies. Let's take a look at the impact here. Irregular expenditure, ineffective project management, ineffective cost management, and obviously a lack of countability there as can be seen as well. Taking a look now at the auditor's comments, cannot believe that such clear cases of irregular expenditure where payments are made to service provider in the absence of a formal contract are condoned. Uh, taking a look at further auditor's comments, there is absolutely no justification for allowing such incidents to occur, whether the CFO has granted permission or not. Moving on to the auditor's recommendation, service providers should be suspended until the service level agreement is in place and also investigate what services were provided in the absence of that formal agreement. A further look at the auditor's recommendations, the full amount should be recovered from the service provider mentioned and also action should be taken against officials who authorise such payment without a formal agreement being put in place. Uh, those are some of the details. Uh, Edwin and Cindy, it's back to you in the, in the main studio for now. Thank you, Abigail. Uh, if you've just joined us, it's a big expose on the workings of Treasury here on ANN7. We're looking at uh, how uh, Treasury has flouted its own procurement regulations, and uh, most of which uh, seems very amateurish. Uh, now we're taking a detailed look at this one company, Cecilia Bits Technologies. Um, it, it's a perfect example of how uh, not to uh, do procurement. Yes, it is. Um, they signed a, a service level agreement, or well, first of all, Bits gave them a quote and said it was around about uh, in the 20 millions. And um, uh, when, they, when, 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 the, when the quote was signed, Treasury had added 10 million to that, inexplicably. Then they realized that there was a problem, so they canceled it. For three months, there was no contract at all. Nevertheless, accounts were paid where there's no, you know, about a million, a million and a half or so was paid to them, even though there is no, um, the, the, you know, there was no, um, you, they, that, that is completely illegal. You can't play if there's no service level agreement. Then they renegotiated for the original amount that this um, company said they were going to, uh, uh, that, that, they, that, that they would be able to cost it over five years. And inexplicably, the five million rand that they had already been paid was not taken into account. So, irregardless of everything, they're still going to be overpaid by five million rand. Um, this is this is one of the this is, this is one of the companies that they have suggested that they get all the money back on. So mm. I think that it kind of indicates that somehow or another, at, you know, this is over 17 months, and you know the, these things are, are happening that nobody seems to be you know really looking at, at what's going on there. Just, just give us more details because there seems to have been a conflict of interest with this particular. Uh, business, uh, bits technologies well, we, in their dealings with Treasury. Uh, we believe that the that the manager uh, or the, the the owner of the business actually worked in the in the Treasury at some stage as a consultant, and then was allowed to consult. We 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 have this. We have our sources tell us that um, this this particular the, the owner of this business, um, in fact, you know. Uh, perhaps knew, uh, perhaps had inside knowledge and may have knew, known about it. And I think that um, in all government procurement, I think they manage that conflict of interest. If you are consulting for something, you can't then bid for it um, in, order to, in order to make sure that you're not making that bid to suit you. Um, this, is, uh, this, is, this is source based information on mm. that company. Now, it also now, according to the report, this Biz Technologies is trading as Abacus Advisory, which is essentially a, a shelf company with no track record. And we know how um, rigid Treasury always talks about the supply chain management and how processes need to be followed. And, and this doesn't seem to be the case, uh, Sfi. So why particularly Biz Technologies? It's very strange unless there's collusion or unless uh, they uh, brought in... Uh, this technology company for exactly that, uh, unless it was uh, an intention perhaps to, to be corrupt. Uh, when one gets a company off the shelf, it doesn't have a, a track record, never mind a good track record, it hasn't done uh, big projects before. When you look at Treasury in this country, 
and how our, our former minister speaks when you look at uh, the ESCOM debacle of how it's handled in our parliament and within the standing committees. You really expect that with Treasury there would be more fluid, that there would be more clear, um, you know, there wouldn't be these issues of uh, collusion, that they'd also apply the law, but that has not happened. And so when you get a minute company, a PTY that has not done any contracts or any tenders before, um, that does not have a, a, a good track record or a record for that matter. Coming in, people who've read this report, you've got to think for yourself, why would this happen? Unless, of course, uh, you know, there's collusion or corruption and this company was brought into Treasury with that in mind. But why is it so, it seems to be easily explained, or as, as you know, no action has come off it, Cecilia, why do you think that this is a matter that has been so swiftly set aside? Well, we know that the report was seen, was, was given to the Director General um, last year, um, um, and it's been sitting there, um, inexplicably been sitting there when it looks as though I, I, we, we, we did go to the we did go to Treasury to find out why nothing has been done so we it, we're a little bit at a loss to explain I mean I, if, if this report had landed on on my desk I would be extremely concerned I would be looking at all of those those reports but the, but the other thing is there's a process you know if you have a report like this that's problematic you should you know take it to to, to Parliament you should you know you, you you should make sure that that um, that 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 these things are are, you know, are, are exposed. So we're still waiting for Treasury to really explain to us why it is that this report is, is, is sitting there and whether any of the corrective action has been taken. It's very specific around the corrective action. You know, these, report, these, these companies need to be, the, the negotiations, I mean, they need to be um, removed off the, off the list. They need to go through a, a, a proper tender process, et cetera, et cetera. So hopefully, hopefully somebody is going to be sitting and looking at this report tonight. Yeah, as mentioned, of course, uh, sorry, sorry, Fiso, this is a report that we will ventilate uh, in uh, small bite sizes until we get to the bottom of it. There are a number of other companies that are implicated in the irregular uh, tender processes uh, within Treasury in that specific time frame. But there's also the issue of unauthorized payments made to Bids Technologies in this report. We go to our colleague Abigail Fasahi for more. It's over to you, Abby. Let's take a closer look at uh, Bits Technologies and uh, the agreement overlooks unauthorized payments to uh, Bits, uh, Bits Technologies. Bits Technologies quoted 28 million rand over five years in response to the request uh, for quotation. But Treasury signed service level agreement for 39 million rand, 11 million rand more than the quote was. Also, DG cancels the memo on the 30th of September 2014 in order to uh, correct the excess amount uh, in that agreement. But Bits Technology was already paid that 5.8 million rand in six months up to February 2015. The second service level agreement was signed for 28 million rand without offsetting the 5.8 million that was already paid. And uh, taking a further look, this would likely result in an overpayment of about 12 million rand to Bits Technologies. Let's take a look at the impact now. Potential fruitless and wasteful expenditure, potential unauthorized expenditure, Expenditure, also ineffective cost management, ineffective project management as well, and potential overspending as well. Those are some of the impacts. Recommendations now, management should revisit the second service level agreement to offset the payment of that 5.8 million rand. Also irregular expenditure being incurred as the total money committed to the service provider will be more than that of the approved contract. Uh, that's it for now. Taking a look there at the auditor's comments. So I'm going to toss back to main studio uh, to continue that discussion. Uh, Edwin and Cindy, it's back to you for now. Thanks so much, uh, Abby. And we'll go back to our studio panelists and we'll start uh, with uh, Professor Thomas Hausen in the the right to know of citizens when it comes to contracts. We've seen an initiative of an open tender process, but obviously some of them do go under the radar. Uh, and this particular one, clearly there, there is um, 
regulation or processes that have been flouted, just the quotation, the invoice alone, vis-a-vis -vis what Treasury ultimately signed as a server level, service level agreement. Is there an oversight, or rather a, uh, you know, where, where managers can make up their own mind as they go along based on uh, their, their own relationship with, uh, with uh, certain contractors? You don't want to, um, <clears throat> to immobilize administration. You don't want to have a system where uh, politicians can no longer take decisions because everything has been prescribed in a budget and has been um, uh, completely predetermined for years to come. So there has to be some discretion, there has to be some uh, flexibility. But like in all good administration, um, there has to be oversight and there has to be audits. But besides the audits, there has to be performance management. In, in, in more successful and, and modern environments, we will find performance management right down to very, very small details where the, the computer system will flag if a certain keyboard hasn't been touched for 30 minutes and then somebody can intervene and find out what is happening to this workstation. Why is that keyboard not active? And, and find out maybe that uh, particular official has absconded or maybe the official is, uh, is ill or there's another good reason for it. Otherwise, corrective measure can be taken. Uh, the systems, for instance, will know if, if customers, when they, when they take a ticket to be served, um, whether they're uh, in the system for more than 11 minutes on certain licensing issues and then there will be an intervention so that you avoid situations that we have, for instance, in the Department of Labor here with UIF where people come uh, and start queuing in Pretoria at 5 o'clock in the morning yeah, to be attended possibly sometime yes. at midday. Yeah, but I want to I wanted to exercise the whole right of uh, a discretion that you can use having a closed tender uh, because, you know, a particular firm was mm -hmm. either recommended or they had a contract with another department uh, within government. And, and where the checks and balances ought to be in Treasury, uh, if, if you look at the scrutiny that the Tegeta agreement with ESCOM had uh, had and the reports that have been sent to explain that particular transaction not being satisfactory uh, with a panel of uh, members of Treasury trying to interpret a very technical report. Why has the same not been done with the Spitz technologies? Well, it's very strange to me why it was not done. But I would imagine that since they paid it 11 million rand, more than they should have then for, for that reason, that would be my explanation. Because I don't think that you just get paid 11 million rand more than you deserve for nothing. Obviously, there's a trail, and that trail should lead to corruption. And further, in this country, that, that, that trail should lead to someone being jailed or someone paying back the money or someone being axed. I don't think it's a matter that uh, South Africans must leave. I just wanted to highlight on this point um, from this report that the DG cancelled the memo on the 30th of September 2019 in order to correct the excess amount of the agreement. At the 30th September when? 20, 2014. Mm -hmm. My mind is on 20, 2019 for some reason. Mm -hmm. So in 2014, uh, in order to correct the, the excess amount in the agreement. But BITS Technology was already paid 5.8 million in six months up to February 2015. So the second level, uh, the second service level agreement was signed for 28 million rand without offsetting the 5.8 million that was already paid. So uh, perhaps the DG tried to, to amend the process, but uh, Treasury had already paid out, and so people's money had, had already left. I think moving on, Treasury might try and amend and say, and say, hey, we tried to, to look at the processes and we tried not to, you know, to, to, to adhere to, to corruption or we tried to save uh, state funds. But uh, you're dealing here with millions. And I don't think Treasury, we're talking about the national Treasury here, the, the storekeeper of, of the South African state. We're literally talking about the, the, the fund manager of, of this country. How do you just give away 5 million and uh, 28 million without accountability with, to the wrong companies and to the wrong people and they have not done the work? I think it's something that is concerning, but uh, it is out there now. Cecilia, the name of Mohammed uh, Amin Kasim is central to, to, to this uh, mm. as, as uh, the director of mm. BIT uh, mm. Technologies. 
Now, he worked in, in Treasury as, as a consultant. Mm. Uh, that clearly is a conflict of interest. Mm. Just to take us through how, even when Treasury uh, discovered the mistake, mm. um, instead of offsetting uh, th this figure that Sviso mentioned, mm. Mm. actually ended up um, overlooking that. Well, that's, I mean, I think that's, that, that's, that, that's a, key to the, a key to this particular contract is that um, it was so badly managed right from the start. Um, first of all, we, we, can't, we can't ascertain whether it was a proper tender process that went through. It was given to somebody who uh, we believe was a, a, a contractor, a, um, a, a consultant, I beg your pardon, in the department. Um, it was then given to a company which, um, as Afisa put, put, put out, doesn't seem to have very good credentials. Then they give a they give a, a quote to the to, to to government, and the gov and and then, you know, inexplicably they get paid 11, 11 million rand more. So you, whether it's whether it's that company or whether it's the lack of controls that is that is the problem. The thing is that. I, I understand what Professor is saying that you don't want to over control things, but you need to have checks and balances. And what what is extraordinary is that that even though there was a fair amount of time between the awarding of the contract and the then you know deciding that the service level agreement should be cancelled, nobody nobody really looked at the whole thing. I mean, how does five million rand just sort of sort of I don't know how to describe it. It just just doesn't get taken into account when they when they when they do the second service level agreement. Mm. So they, so yeah. they, so they so that this this company is, will be paid five million in excess of what they deserve for whatever work they were doing. Yeah. Uh, and, and I mean, Tsepo, in terms of, you know, we've seen this with the Auditor General generally uh, not giving clean reports uh, for various departments, but why is it even more critical that Treasury's house is in order? Very important. We saw in uh, Polo, uh, not Polo Kwan, but Mangaung, 2012, the African National Congress took a decision or a resolution to centralize procurement. That made uh, Treasury effectively a super ministry, and as far as uh, procurement decisions are concerned. Now, to go and have the very same department that is supposed to be the guardian of all things procurement, to itself be procuring goods and services without following due processes, that itself uh, is a shocker. But what is more horrifying is the fact that uh, former minister uh, Pravin Godan, as the accounting authority, together with this uh, director general as the accounting officer, regardless of the internal audit report that they were furnished with, which clearly demonstrated that there was no basis, they had reached a dead end. They still found it necessary to go and even now go and procure on a much more longer term basis with an even more uh, financially uh, intense uh, decision of signing with uh, Oracle on this integrated financial management system, which as we say that is uh, probably about 100 billion rand over the life of the contract and how could they do that because the scope could not have been clearly defined from the report that they have in hand. So what must be done? That's the question I think that South Africans should be asking. What must be done? Clearly, it would appear that there was dereliction of fiduciary duty by both the accounting authority being the minister as well as the accounting uh, officer being Mr. Fuzile. Both of them need to be held to account in a proper forum and the proper forum that there must be a thorough investigation and that investigation most probably the SIU will be the best body to go and investigate as to what were the circumstances that led them knowing what they knew because we are reflecting on a report which even though that report was finished to them they still went ahead and procured uh, the system with Oracle 100 billion rand later, and they never once pleaded that in Parliament whenever they were doing presentations to say, Parliament, we are happy to inform you 
or inform the South African citizenry that we now have an integrated financial management system, but be aware that the cost is 100 billion rand. They never once did that, and it is important that they must account and they must face the nation, but not let's, only face the nation, they must face the law. Let, let's go to Abigail Fisaki. She's got more on uh, how this deal uh, between uh, Bates Technologies and, and Treasury uh, unfolded. Uh, we've just uh, got uh, a tweet from the ANC Youth League saying that, uh, you know, the current finance minister, Madusi Gigawa, needs to get to the bottom of this. I mean, clearly he's been left holding the baby by the previous administration. We'll come back and discuss that. Let's go to Abigail now. She's going to tell us more details on uh, another uh, oversight between Treasury and Bits Technologies in terms of uh, double payments. Hmm. Abigail? Thank you very much, Edwin. Indeed, let's take a look at those uh, double payments uh, to Bits Technologies. Amount of 776,075 rand, 40, uh, 52 cents was paid for services rendered from the 7th of September 2014 to the 18th of October 2014. Taking a look at other payments, an amount of 718,373 rand and 28 cents paid for services rendered from the 12th of October 2014 to the 8th of November 2014. Two invoices include uh, hours for days from the 12th to the 18th of October 2014, which indicates that the hours for the said week was indeed duplicated there. And uh, the impact on this regard, overpayment, duplicate payments, uh, as mentioned, ineffective project management and ineffective cost management as well in that regard. Can I tell us back to the main studio, Cindy and Edwin, it's back to you. Thanks so much, uh, Abby. We have uh, Mosiri Tiane. Just from a point of view of running, uh, albeit even a small business, that you need to have the scope, you need to be able to me measure uh, what, what your plans and projects are going to yield. In this particular case, that did not happen. And we see that it then opened up uh, a room for manipulation and, and room for, uh, for monies or duplicates duplicate payment for that matter without even an existing contract and with uh, one contract still uh, being reviewed, etc. It's a, it's a complete mess. One would, would have said the correct word is that the department during that period was captured by this private company. There's no question about it. And, and, and it needs to come out in the clear that we're dealing here with people whom we are expecting excellency. This is, this is the department where it ought to perform extremely well above each and every department out there, above the municipalities overall, should overlook each and every department and make sure that the finances in that, but to make it duplicate. And this is the internal audit report. This internal audit report reflects there and there. We do not know how many duplicate payments did they make. It's just a tip of an iceberg. That's our support, what is being said, that I, uh, an, an intensive investigation must be done in there so that we can find out how many payments were done. Uh, you, 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 have, you have a situation where you can see that the minister who is so bitter, what is it that he's been protecting in there? What has he been protecting? Why is he been pointing figure and says, no, no, my house is clean. Look at this one. Look at that one. Those ones are the corrupt. Don't come over here. What has made him so bitter? Surely there is so much more when an investigation can be done in that department. I can rest assured that in his tenure, when he's been saving that department, a lot is going to come out. Cecilia, I mean, we again go back to the issue of uh, inflating uh, payments uh, yes. uh, double paying uh, as in this instance with the uh, Beats Technologies. Uh, it, 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 it's amateurish, if I could put it that way, for, for Treasury to, to, to be dealing with a company like that. Uh, a lot of people will be surprised that uh, the Treasury did not have uh, its proper systems in place. Perhaps Tepo would not be surprised, or perhaps Musiri <laughs> would not be surprised, but, but the, the public out there would be uh, quite surprised that uh, the, the institution that is supposed to be um, looking after our purse uh, is making what basically amounts to be an amateurish uh, decision. Yes, uh, it looks as though, uh, and, and we, I think we've, we've, we've traversed this quite a lot, looks as though there were no systems in place um, for, you know, this was about billing of hours and for, you know, uh, for billing of hours, <laughs> You, if, if you, a, a normal computer program should be able to pick up that with, with ease. More uh, timesheets. Time, you know, maybe old-fashioned time. We should go back to old-fashioned timesheets, you know. But, uh, you know, if, if billing of ours, 
you, you should be able to, you, you should be able to see this. You know that, but the other thing about it is that consultants charge government enormous amounts of money per hour to double bill for those hours is is you know it, it, it and 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 believe that maybe you can get away with it is just you know completely unacceptable. So I think that once again you know I think this whole this whole investigation has shown time time and time again with all of these transactions and there'll be many more as we go through the uh, go through next week um, is, is that there do, there were no systems in this particular in this particular department they didn't put in place the right systems to start with and so all of their decision making following that is flawed and there's something about you know the impact of that you know, is that it, you know it would be good if we had a system in government where departments could speak to each other financial systems can speak to each other mm. etc cetera, etc cetera. it it would make logical sense for those things to work flawlessly but if 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 this system is being put in place by people who cannot do basic accounting practices then you know the the system that they intend to put in place cannot be in any way um, going to work for our for our communities, and we are, we're a developing country. You know, these decisions always have an impact at the at the at the lowest level with the poorest person who's trying to get a social grant, for example. You know, you, you can talk about you know Parliament and this that and the next. Thing. The fact of the matter is that in our society, government needs to work for the people, and 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 if it's working just for a few companies that are trying to make mega bucks out of government, then there's a problem. Mm. I mean, it starts from the preamble earlier. You're saying that the inter integrated financial management system project was meant to essentially do that, that there's a seamless way of doing business with government and accountability. Mm -hmm. All of those things can be measured. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, we're now sitting with this particular situation. We go across to our colleague Abigail with more details about the irregularities with the business technologies and the duplicate payments. What more is there in this report, Abby? Hmm. Cindy, no doubt that it's a lot to take in. Let's, let's uh, recap what we've exposed uh, from this uh, report. Uh, Treasury's catastrophic report card. The findings total of 54 IFMS financial processes were flagged in this internal report. Uh, 49 of those processes were found to be marked as catastrophic. Also, taking a look at further findings, five other financial processes were assessed as high risk. A further look at findings from that report and what else was found. Audit found no business case for formulating of IFMS project management offers. Just quickly taking a recap of what has been exposed this evening. No budget information and no budget breakdown per financial year. And also project costs monitoring uh, was lacking in that regard. Formal independent quality assurance function was also found to be missing due to that or in that report. Incomplete payment register was also another finding that was made. Excessive project management office expenditure is another finding that was made. And ineffective resource management uh, as well. Uh, taking a look further at Treasury's catastrophic report card, more findings, undefined purpose, scope and objectives of the payment uh, procedure, inadequate delegation of authority for payment procedure as well. That's taking a look at some of those basic findings that was exposed uh, in that report. Taking a further look at IFMS processes flawed from the outset catastrophic, uh, catastrophic findings, Treasury never stated a business case for the creation of the IFMS project management office with a, one point, a 145 million rand budget uh, in that regard. Also contracts awarded without addressing key aspects of a PMO function like quality, risk and cost management as well. Also in just 17 months, 139 million rand of that approved budget, total of 145 million rand uh, was spent and only 6 million rand was left for the remaining 43 months. Let's take a look at uh, further uh, graphics here. No business case for creating a PMO. The impact and the main recommendations. Potential fruitless and wasteful expenditure. The recommendation current panel to be scrapped and a new panel to be installed via a competitive bidding process. More impacts and recommendations. Potential overspending on approved IFMS 
uh, PMO budget. The recommendation in this regard, a business case to be developed for formulation of the outstanding PMO services in accordance with the approved budget. Taking a further look, the impact, inadequate contract management, the main recommendation in that regard, 10 processes outlined for effective and efficient financial management of the PMO. Taking a further look, inadequate and ineffective PMO function, the main recommendation there, 10 processes outlined for effective and efficient financial management of the PMO. A company that's been man, um, uh, mentioned excuse me, this evening, Bits Technologies, let's take a closer look at payments made to that company, Bits Technologies, without any approval, approval of agreement. Market is catastrophic as well. The first service level agreement with 39 million rand with Bits Technologies was cancelled. That was cancelled on the 30th of September 2014. Also, the second agreement was signed on the 8th of December 2014 for a revised value of 28 million rand. Payment of 1.5 million rand was made to Bits for services rendered from October 2014 to the 7th of December 2014. And money paid for a period when no service level agreement existed between Treasury and the named Bits Technologies. Let's take a look at the impact. This has irregular expenditure, ineffective project management, ineffective cost management and a lack of accountability as well. Taking a look at the auditor's comments, cannot believe that such clear cases of irregular expenditure where payments are made to service provider in the absence of a formal contract uh, are condoned. Also, there is absolutely no justification for allowing such incidents to occur, whether the CFO has granted permission or not. Taking a look at further recommendations here. Service providers should be suspended until the service level agreement is uh, eventually put in place and also investigate what services were provided in the absence of that formal agreement. Taking a further look, the full amount should be recovered from that service provider mentioned and also action should be taken against officials who authorize such payment without having a formal agreement put in place. Taking a look at unauthorized uh, payments that were paid uh, to Bits Technologies, also marked as catastrophic. Bits Technologies quoted 28 million rand over five years in response to the request for quotation. But Treasury signed a service level agreement for 39 million rand, 11 million rand more than uh, what was originally quoted. Also, the DG cancels the memo on the 30th of September 2014 in order to correct the excess amount in that said agreement. But Bits Technology was already paid 5.8 million rand in the six months up to February 2015. Also, the second service level agreement was signed for 28 million rand without offsetting the original 5.8 million rand that had already been paid in that regard. This would likely result in an overpayment of 12 million rand to Bits Technologies. Let's unpack the impact here. Uh, potential fruitless and wasteful expenditure gain, potential unauthorized expenditure, ineffective cost management, ineffective project management as well, and lastly, potential overspending in that regard as well. Let's take a look at recommendations. Management should revisit the second service level agreement to offset the payment of 5.8 million rand. More recommendations coming, or auditors' comments, excuse me. Irregular expenditure being incurred as the total money committed to the service provider will be more than that of the approved contract. Uh, let's take a look at uh, further payments here in this regard. That is the duplicate payments that was paid to the so-called BITS technologies. Amount of uh, 776,075 rand and 52 cents was paid for services rendered from 7th of September 2014 to the 8th of October 2014. More duplicate payments coming to the fore. Amount of uh, 718,370 rand 28 cents was paid for services rendered. That was from 12th of October 2014 to the 8th of November. 2014. Now, two invoices include hours for days from the 12th to the 18th of October 2014, which indicates that the hours for the said week were indeed duplicated. Uh, further impacts, overpayment, duplicate payment, ineffective project management and ineffective cost management as well. It's a lot to take in, but we are going to unpack uh, these details uh, throughout uh, next week as well. But let's go back to the main studio. Back to you, Cindy and Edwin.
Thank you, Abigail. Yeah, you're quite right. Uh, remember that uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg uh, in terms of this uh, internal audit uh, report that uh, the DG of Treasury set on. We'll give you uh, the rest of the expose and the other companies that are involved that have benefited from Treasury as the, day, as the days go by. So do stay tuned because there's more to see. But thanks indeed uh, to our panelists. And we'll be back on Tuesday with this particular uh, special focus on what exactly went wrong in Treasury with regards to the integrated financial management system. Cecilia Russell is ANN7 Special Projects Editor. Sviso Mathlango is resident political analyst. And we have Professor Andre Thomashausen, constitutional law expert. Musiri Tsiane is the chairperson of the South African Liberty Foundation. Tsepo Khadima, a political analyst. Analysts indeed much appreciated. We take a quick ad break. Do stay with Africa News Network only on DSTV 405. Good night.